Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Tenement Museum Book Talks. I am here tonight. My name is Katie. I am Work and Visitor Services at the Tenement Museum, and I'm here tonight with Daniel Gorodnik, former New York City Council member, to talk about his book, Saving Syvacent Town. Um, everyone, please welcome Daniel Gorodnik. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the Lower East Side Tenement Museum for having me tonight. Uh, I will say that uh, the Tenement Museum is one of my absolute favorite institutions in the city. I love how it tells the story of uh, New York's uh, immigration uh, history. And uh, I was even uh, the lawyer for the Tenants of Tenement uh, uh, Museum um, before I ran for the city council. So it's been a long and wonderful history. So I'm so, so pleased to be here tonight. Um, and I, uh, I wanted to uh, start before we get into um, you know a, a Q and A uh, about this story uh, with a little bit of a background. Um, uh, I was elected to the New York City Council in November of two thousand five and took office in January two thousand six, uh, and six and a half months into my very first term as a New York City councilman, about twenty percent of my district went up for sale. Needless to say, that does not usually happen. Built by the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company as housing for veterans returning from World War II, Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village, it's the biggest rental community in the United States. And it's home to about 30,000 mostly middle-class people on the east side of Manhattan. And since this is a tenement museum audience, um, I will talk a little bit more about the history because I think it's of interest. And I will note that Stuyvesant Town was the brainchild of Robert Moses, uh, who was fixated on housing creation and slum clearance in the 1940s. And there were very few opportunities for him to do such a thing in Manhattan. Park Chester had already been built in the Bronx, also by MetLife, but he wanted to find a good site uh, in Manhattan. And he found one uh, on the east side between 14th and 20th streets in what was known as a gas house district. It was the site where gas was manufactured from coal. It was there to provide light and heat for a good part of Manhattan. And scattered in this industrial area were the homes to about 11,000 people. They were mostly poor immigrants living in tenement buildings, likely similar to the one at 97 Orchard Street. And Robert Moses saw an opportunity to transform an entire neighborhood into something quite different. Uh, Moses partnered with Mayor LaGuardia, the New York State Legislature, and the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, and the city and state allowed for the condemnation of all of that land and enabled MetLife to push out the people who lived there in what the New York Times called the biggest mass migration in New York City's history. So people sort of had their belongings out on the street and they were trying to find uh, new homes, which was not something that was required of the new developer. And what went up in its place was an entire community of red brick buildings, built to house the veterans returning home from World War II. The white veterans, I should point out, MetLife in those days had a discriminatory housing policy, and they concluded that black and white residents would be better off if kept separate. And they believed that was certainly the case for their real estate investments. And they built a second housing complex in Harlem called Riverton to do just that. Now we could spend this entire evening talking about the important civil rights battle that ensued and the role that the future residents of Stytown played in not only integrating the community, but also in demanding a change in city law that prohibited housing discrimination in future similar projects. But I will refer you for the moment to chapter one in my book. But suffice it to say that it was a turbulent start for MetLife. 
a start that they survived. In fact, over time, MetLife became a generally well-liked new owner of the property. And under the care of Mother Met, as MetLife was affectionately known to tenants in the years, you know, 1950 to 1990 or so, Stytown was a quiet enclave in busy Manhattan designed to resemble more like suburban living where people could safely raise their kids and they tended to stay there for decades. And that's exactly how it was for my own family. I, I grew up in the neighborhood, uh, an only child of a public school teacher and a portfolio manager. And my formative years were in a two bedroom apartment in Peter Cooper. Uh, my mom moved into the community in 1968. My dad joined her when they got married and they never moved out uh, because it afforded them a reasonable rent, beautiful grounds, and more space than they otherwise could enjoy in Manhattan. They lived in what was called a, still is called, a rent stabilized unit, uh, which as I'm sure many of the viewers of this program know, uh, meant that their rent was well below the market rate and could only go up by an amount that was prescribed by a public board. Then what happened? In July of 2006, at the height of the real estate boom, the unthinkable happened, at least it was unthinkable to the people who lived there, most of them at least. MetLife announced that it was going to put all 110 buildings in Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village up for sale. Suddenly marketing an opportunity for a new owner to take this historically middle-class community and create a luxury product out of these red brick buildings. As you might imagine, the opportunity to own 80 acres of land in Manhattan does not come along every day. And the real estate world went simply berserk. Bidders from across the globe participated in a white hot auction that bid the property over $5 billion with a B billions more than what had been contemplated by experts only a few months earlier. The property sold for $5.4 billion in October of 2006 to Tishman Spire and BlackRock. And it became the largest residential real estate transaction in American history. And the new owners were ready and they were poised to usher in a new era to this middle-class community. What kind of new era? Well, it wasn't one that the tenants particularly wanted. At the time of the sale, three quarters of the units were rent stabilized, remember protected with below market rents, and the rest were renting at the market rate. Tishman Spire and BlackRock had just taken on $4.4 billion in debt. So they put down a billion in equity. They borrowed $4.4 billion. And they had to find a way to generate more revenue from the property in order to pay off those debts and to make their deal profitable. And there were ways for them to do that. Most importantly for an, an owner, uh, under New York law at the time, uh, you could take a low rent apartment out of rent stabilization once it became vacant. That was called vacancy decontrol. So what that meant was if you can raise the rents on an apartment once it became vacant, the remaining rent stabilized tenants were a direct obstacle to getting rental income up and allowing $4.4 billion of debt to be repaid. This deal did not pencil out unless Tishman Spire and BlackRock got these people out of their units and fast. And what happened was this century's most significant housing battle quickly developed. Tishman Spire hung luxury rentals banners on the sides of the red brick buildings, as if perhaps to disguise them. Uh, they closed the local supermarket. They replaced it with a gym. They offered new amenities for a fee to, to attract younger tenants. They hosted 
rock concerts in the middle of Stuyvesant Oval and invited the whole world to come in and see the property. Put those issues aside. Most significantly, they tried to create vacancies. Legal claims, many with flimsy allegations, such as arguing that people didn't actually live in their rent stabilized apartments, which is a requirement under rent stabilization law. Those legal claims rain down on many longtime, perfectly legitimate tenants, putting them on notice that they were going to be evicted. Now, the Tenants Association and I, we encourage people to fight back. And through the course of a decade, we used every ounce of leverage that we could find. And it really is the important point of the book, which is leverage, even more specifically, creating some when you have none. So how did we do that? Well, first, in 2006, when we learned that MetLife was going to sell Stytown, rather than just sit on the sidelines, we decided to take the risky move of trying to become bidders in the transaction and try to buy the property ourselves. Of course, we didn't go door to door collecting funds. Rather, we publicly announced that we were planning to put together an investor group to buy the property from MetLife. And we invited various institutions with money to come forth and partner with us. We had no money and we truly had no business announcing that we were going to compete with the world's most significant real estate entities. It could have been a spectacular failure, but we took a risk and we did it anyway. And sure enough, nearly every investor looking to get an edge in this deal reached out to us with an eye toward partnership. Ultimately, we, the tenants, put together a four and a half billion dollar bid to buy the property. Four and a half billion dollars, not bad. It came $900 million short of what it was sold for. But at four and a half billion dollars, those sums surprised a lot of people. And they made them pay a lot closer attention to the Tenants Association and their brand new city councilman. We also litigated and won the biggest tenant victory in the New York Court of Appeals in a generation. MetLife and then Tishman Spire, they'd been taking advantage of a tax abatement while also deregulating apartments at the same time. Our reading of that law made it seem pretty simple. When you take this tax break, you can't deregulate units. And we litigated all the way up to the New York State's highest court, the Court of Appeals. And they agreed with the tenants. And the result was no unit of Stytown could be taken out of rent stabilization. That, of course, made it impossible for Tishman Spire to achieve its business goals. It removed the most critical tool that they had in their arsenal, vacancy decontrol, to raise rents. And while they were pretty much on their way to failure on their own, this was the final nail in the coffin. And in 2010, Tishman Spire, in fact, defaulted on their loans. And just four years after its first sale in 2006, a special servicer named CW Capital stepped in to represent the senior lenders in the deal. They became the decision maker about the future. And the future of the community was, again, uncertain. Industry titans were circling Stytown again. Donald Trump. Wilbur Ross, Bill Ackman, joining big names from the 2006 deal like the government of Singapore, the Church of England, the pension funds of California and Florida. But things had changed for the tenants in the interim. Through our advocacy and agitation over many years, the real estate world had become much more aware of the tenants' presence and influence. We had tried to force a preemptive sale to the tenants. We litigated our rights in court. We built alliances throughout the city. We'd gotten the elected leadership from the city to back us, including getting Mayor de Blasio in my living room in Peter Cooper for an important photo op eating cannoli with tenant leaders. And we made the Tenants Association, yes, the tenants, even with 30,000 constituents, a viable commercial actor able to strike a deal. And it was the tenant's influence that drove the ultimate result in Stytown. And that result, spoiler alert here, was the largest residential 
It was the largest housing preservation deal in New York City's history. It was a partnership between Blackstone, CW Capital, and the city. And the tenants preserved thousands of affordable housing units for the next generation. And we did it through a regulatory agreement that runs with the property. So it doesn't matter who the owner is, it runs with the land. And that result was far from a foregone conclusion. Uh, and I will almost close here because the incredible part of this story is that CW Capital on behalf of the lenders had no obligation to strike an affordable housing deal with us. The city had no legal power to force them to the negotiating table. The tenants certainly had no rights to force this outcome. I, I didn't as the local city councilman. And if CW Capital had allowed it, any new owner could have simply paid top dollar in the sale and taken steps to make Stytown the luxury community that MetLife had pitched and Tishman, Tishman Spire had aspired to do slowly and steadily over time. But by the time that the property was going to be sold to the next owner, CW Capital and all prospective buyers understood that any deal was going to need to satisfy the tenants and the city. And because of our strength, we had the ability to not only drive down the sale price, but relatedly because we got Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to commit not even to lend funds in any deal that did not have the support of the tenants in the city, we had the ability to drive up the cost of borrowing. So the story of saving Stuyvesant Town is how this community navigated a complex public and private negotiation over many years, building political support, keeping the community organized and generating leverage. And you all know what typically happens in these situations, the deal is done, the tenants are displaced, money is made, that's exactly what happened in 2006. And frankly, it's also what happened in 1943. And this book tells the story about what is possible when a strategic and well-organized community comes together to fight for their homes and how these New Yorkers banded together to fight back against corporate greed and excess and how the real estate world concluded that actually working with the tenants would yield a better outcome than a prolonged battle and how a choppy and successful negotiation played out in both public and private over many years and delivered a really extraordinary outcome for middle-class New Yorkers. So thank you so much for this. The book is, this is the week. It's an official publication date is Thursday. So the timing here is excellent. So I thank you uh, so much for the opportunity to, to give the intro. And now I'm ready to hear some questions. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, and yes, so um, I we're going to show a little because our audience, we're hoping, is not just New Yorkers. So we do want to give you some images to put in your mind to connect with um, the history of this housing development. Um, but also, I want to mention while I'm sharing, while I'm getting my screen set up to share and start talking, that we can take questions throughout this program. So if you are um, viewing the program, please put in the YouTube chat um, any questions, and they will be uh, given to me so I can intersperse them throughout the conversation. Um, also, the book is available through the Tenement museum shop. So if you would like to purchase that, you can do so through our website, through our online shop. And lastly, this book talk is free, but if you'd like to give us a donation, the link for that will also be in the chat here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up my screen and show a couple of images of both the area that Stuyvesant Town now sits on before during and after construction of Stuyvesant Town. So we can give all of you a little bit of a viewing of what it looks like there. Okay. And Daniel, I'll let you go ahead and talk, talk us through a little bit about what we're seeing here on the two images side by side. Sure. Um, well, what you have in the, in the first image on the left is your typical uh, New York City, Manhattan street grid. Um, and you can see the, on the left-hand side, uh, all the way, um, you know, on the left-hand side of the left-hand picture, you can see First Avenue. In the right-hand side, you have uh, for uh, you have the East River and you can see a couple of the, um, you know, the tanks, uh, which would evidence manufactured gas in the bottom right hand corner of that site. 
And then if you look over at the right-hand picture, you can see that as part of this uh, development, uh, the city allowed MetLife to take the entire city grid and replace it with a super block, uh, which has no uh, streets within it. It is entirely private property and it is imbued with a sense of um, inaccessibility, at least that's how it was intended by MetLife when it was built. Um, and, uh, you know, as part of that change, there were uh, not only individuals who were displaced from their homes, but there were uh, churches and schools and civic associations. I mean, that was a, that's a big, big uh, neighborhood right there. <clears throat> and addresses like on, uh, you know, 15th Street and 16th Street, 17th Street, disappeared off the city grid forever um, and became what you see on the right-hand side, which is what Stuyvesant Town uh, looks like today. And I think one of the other great things about um, this image that I'm sure many in our audience will know is that you did mention that Robert Moses, this was a driving force, Robert Moses was behind this. And you can kind of see in these two pictures, a lot of that idea that Moses had. So like on the the picture where you can see the typical grid of the New York streets, the buildings are really close. There's not a lot of outdoor space. Um, and you look at Stuyvesant Town and you see the outdoor spaces that are put in there, the green spaces that are put into, into the buildings, the design of the buildings, um, the way that they're made into those cross shapes. So you can really get an idea. I know a lot of people don't usually get to see this. Um, when they talk about Robert Moses, you can see the physical changes um, the ideas that were being put behind when the city did this. And by the way, one, one thing that I would add, and just for the interest of, um, of completion, on the right-hand image, you can see in the top part, you see some buildings that are a little further spaced apart. Um, and that is uh, Peter Cooper Village, which goes from 20th to 23rd Street. And it was built roughly at the same time, but without the same agreement between MetLife and the city of New York, but it was built by the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. And uh, they are operated today as a unified whole uh, and they're owned together. I'm gonna move on. So this is a um, pre-image of the neighborhood before Stuyvesant Town was built, correct? That's right. I mean, that is, that's 20th Street looking east toward First Avenue. Really what that shows you is what the, the manufactured gas environment looked like over there. It was very industrial, uh, you know, not, uh, this was not glamorous living, living in this neighborhood at the time. Um, and uh, surely that is why Robert, Mo Robert Moses set his eyes on this area as, and by the way, this, what you're seeing in this image is a block away from Stytown. Stytown would start where you see that actual <laughs> a big uh, gas tank over there um, where he said, you know what, this is, um, this is an area that is ripe for a renewal, urban renewal. Uh, and, um, and thus, uh, you know, he did all sorts of machinations and plans with the New York state legislature to give MetLife a deal that he thought that they would take in order to get this all done. And one of the, um, I know that you said the Stuyvesant Town is going to start where the industrial part starts here, but we're about to go to an image of seeing the community taken down that was already here. And as you can see, this is, there is residential living going on here. It's very apparent there's a, an elevated walkway um, right down the, the way. I believe that's the elevated train that's right there. Um, and you have the cars on the street. You can see there's a lot of parking. You can see that these are single family homes much of which you'd see throughout the city at the time. So there is there is a community living here right now. And some of that is going to disappear when Stuyvesant Town comes in. So I'm gonna to go to the next image. Uh, and this is another typical back end of the buildings that were there. So you can see that again, very little outdoor space, communal building living happening here. Um, and this is very, this is what, when you go to the Tenement Museum, you will see this very set up in the background here um, of one building looking directly onto another here. So there's no space in between you, literally your yards abut each other. There's no alleyway. And this is a, a post demolition photo. Daniel, do you want to talk a little yeah, bit? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a mid demolition <laughs> photo, it looks like, but it gives you a sense of what's coming down in the midst of all of this. Um, you know, the idea that you're, you know, it, it, we can almost not really imagine today the idea of clearing out 
um, you know, you know, it wasn't, it was almost 80 acres. It was probably about 70 acres of land. Um, and, you know, to displace everything in its path. I mean, it's just, it's just unfathomable, which is one of the reasons why I, I think that this part of the history is important um, because it, you know, it goes to the bigger picture reason why Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village are important to the city, should be important to the city, because this is part of its history. The displacement of poor immigrant people, the exclusion of black residents in, its, in the beginning, the, 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 the existence of a contractual agreement between the city and met life for so many years. So anyway, this this is this is uh, the impact of uh, the state legislative action, the city's uh, votes at both the city planning uh, commission and the board of aldermen. This is uh, this is what well, what the result was in the interim. And one of the, the points that you make in the book as well is that um, when MetLife, besides having the race clause in it that is very famous that has been talked about, um, they you had to have a minimum income to qualify for the new buildings, which many of the people who had lived in this area wouldn't have um, been able to meet to be able to even get an apartment in Stuyvesant Town when it opened. So you, they were also displacing people who would not be able to live in those apartments. That's right. It was doing really nothing for them. Not only did it not require MetLife to find replacement housing uh, for the displaced people, but it also allowed them to create housing, which was truly inaccessible to them at the same time. And I, I think- Blank this, canvas. There it is. A blank yeah, canvas. blank canvas. <laughs> Very what rare I, in New York. <laughs> one of the things that I love about this picture, though, is it's so interesting. You can actually, if you look really closely into that blank canvas, you can start seeing the formation, the foundation of some of the buildings, particularly on the, you know, the, the near right-hand corner of the site. A few of the Stytown buildings were already built. You can see in the corner there on the right-hand corner, that's the corner of 14th Street and Avenue C. You can see some of the Peter Cooper buildings uh, going up on 20th Street. Uh, a couple of them are already built. That's 601 East 20th Street uh, and 541 East 20th Street, I believe. So you can, you can see how out of this blank canvas, the, the beginning of a brand new uh, community is coming to be. Oh, and here we are mid, mid happening going on. There it is. You can see the structure of those, uh, the buildings uh, coming to be. And that of course was replicated uh, over and over again uh, to make that, uh, that entire neighborhood. And Daniel, how long did it take to construct Stuyvesant Town, um, most of the buildings? Yeah, it was um, it was ready for occupancy in 1949. So between the date that uh, uh, that they signed a contract between the city and MetLife was 1943. Um, the last resident moved out in 1945, 1949. Uh, you have a, a fresh new community ready for residents, and there was a lot of interest in this community because um, there was a housing crisis in the city. Uh, actually much as there is today. Uh, and you did have an expected infusion of people coming back from World War II. Um, and they had a wait list on the first day they opened uh, registration, they had a wait list already. Um, and people were really clamoring to get into these brand new apartments, of course, desirable, brand new living, uh, reasonable rent that could only go up by the amount that was prescribed by uh, the existing of the, the existence of the contract between MetLife and the city, um, you know, a very a very desirable to, place to uh, to get into in those days. And here we have it: the the units that people would want to get into. There they are, and that's um, uh, that is an early photo. You still see the manufactured uh, gas on the east side of, uh, of Avenue C over there. Uh, you don't yet see any buildings built in Waterside Plaza. So it's pre-Waterside Plaza. Um, and uh, and that is the, uh, that's, that's the, new, the new community right there in its early days. And it's a huge community. Can you remind us of how many units would have been going into this one area? Sure, 11, about 11,200. 32, give or take a few, depending on how you're counting them. But between Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village, uh, that's like a, 
you know, and homes for 25 to 30,000 people. That's like a, a, a small city in many parts of this country, um, you know, with a single owner um, sandwiched into the middle of Manhattan. Uh, it, it, you know, it's an extraordinary feat if you think of it from that perspective um, and an area of really import based on the, the number of people who actually were moving in there and had interests uh, in the, the future of New York City. And I think that's um, really important for later in the conversation to remember how many people are living in these buildings because it is a small city. And so the Tenants Association really came to represent a huge amount of people um, during this housing battle. And they had, to, they had to find ways to diversify that association, which I love that you put into the book. Um, yes, as well. <laughs> that, that's, a, I mean, that of course was, uh, you know, a, a real challenge, right? You have 30,000 people in the community um, how do you get them sort of organized and pulling the boat roughly in the same in the same direction? That is a very difficult uh, task, and we can definitely talk about that more if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then another picture to kind of show um, just how large um, Stuyvesant Town is here. Yes, and you can still see. I mean, there's still the Con Ed uh, power plant right there on 14th Street and Avenue C. Uh, now you can see, uh, of course, it's a color photo, so you know it's a little more modern. And then, of course, with the Waterside Plaza buildings just to the north, um, puts it all in the context. But it does, you can see the size of this thing from this picture. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Um, oh, and we got, we got a question while we were in the photos, which is, what happened to the piers? Oh, the piers were, uh, were eventually uh, taken down slowly and steadily over time. Um, uh, they, they, they became um, a piece of history, like so many of the piers around Manhattan. Uh, Manhattan used to have piers all around it. Now, the piers that remain are uh, a bit of a legacy of, uh, of, of those, those days. Um, and I do, so we, we did, a, I think, a great job of covering a lot of the history of the building of Stuyvesant Town, but I would like to dive into um, really the heart of the book, which is talking about this almost 10 year long <laughs> battle um, to, uh, you know, maintain affordable housing in New York City. And now um, one of the things you point out in the book, and I think that's so important for the audience is that when we are talking about affordable housing, we are predominantly um, in the book talking about middle class housing in New York City. So because there are obviously so many battles about affordable housing on many different income levels. Um, and the book is predominantly focusing on a group of people who would be considered middle class. Um, in New York, in New York City standards, um, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about like why is it so important to have um, middle class affordable housing in New York City? Like why would it be so important to have this number of units available for that? Yeah, I think it's a it's a great question and it's an important one and one that I uh, I try to address in the book because um, the middle class uh, frequently get overlooked in a lot of public programs um, and in many ways appropriately so. Right, it's not the neediest bunch in the city. They have options. Um, they, um, you know, you know, the way I, I like to describe it is the, the idea that somebody might be able to, you know, take their family on a weekend vacation somewhere um, does not mean that they're necessarily, you know, swimming in cash. It may mean that they have a little room for a little luxury. And the middle class in New York City, I think, is really struggling. It, it always has been struggling, and I think it's struggling even more today. And middle class in New York, I think, is a community that, um, that demands uh, results from public schools and attention from elected officials, mass transit, sanitation services. This is like the core of the city that actually is making sure and advocating, raising their voice to make sure that city services are working. So there's actually an interest for all residents at all levels for there to be a robust middle class in the city. Um, and so the, the, this community was, was and is one of those last bastions of uh, middle class affordability for many years. And it was one of the things that we were determined to try to find a way uh, to protect throughout this entire battle. 
And one of the uh, great endearing points of the book is that um, you are a resident um, in that community and that you become involved with the Tenants Association before this, um, this kind of legal battle even started, correct? And before you were a council member or at, right after you joined the council. So I, so I grew up in the neighborhood. I lived in Stuyvesant Town for the first four years of my life. And then my parents made the very big move across 20th Street to Peter Cooper Village. In those days, uh, in 1976, um, uh, Stuyvesant Town did not have air conditioning. But Peter Cooper Village did. It was wired for electricity, uh, for, for, uh, for air conditioning. It had the electrical wiring for AC. And so my parents moved across the street. Um, and, um, and even though um, you know, most of the issues before I was elected to the city council, you know, they were more of the typical landlord tenant sorts of issues like charges on rent bills uh, for major capital improvements that were allowed to be passed on to tenants when a landlord made an improvement or, you know, brown water periodically came, coming out of the faucets and those, those sorts of things. Um, and I had been, um, you know, involved in the Tenants Association, but not deeply involved in the Tenants Association. I was even though I grew up in a rent stabilized apartment, um, when I moved back into the neighborhood after you know uh, college and law school, I was one of the market rate tenants. And so I offered to help the Tenants Association organize some of the newer people, the newer people like me. I'd lived there my whole life, but I was technically in one of the apartments that was being rented to newer people. And so I spent some time trying to find ways to organize uh, the, the new residents and think about what the issues were that most affected them. And then of course, once I was elected to the city council, there was a very close relationship with, uh, uh, with this organization, even though I might add that my opponent in my race for the city council was the lawyer for this tenants association um, who was a household name in the community at the time. So even though, you know, th that was a little bit awkward, there was a very close and it evolved very fast, a working relationship between me and this organization that was, you know, a really important one uh, and really well positioned to help us try to, to protect the residents in an extremely turbulent time. And I think one of the really important things about your book and for anyone um, who goes out and reads it or maybe facing difficulties or is thinking about housing is that A, there was a tenants association already um, in the buildings before the battle happened. Um, but then it's also about creating um, an organization to represent this vast number of individuals in what was going to be a very traumatic period, not just in the housing battle that's happening, but also you had events like the economic crash of 2008 that happened during this time, Hurricane Sandy happened during this time. So lots of different issues, both physical, financial, and stressful about just the ongoing legal battle for the thing, um, thing um, for the housing itself. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about like the evolution of the uh, Tenants Association throughout this time period of this of this like turbulent ten years. Yeah, well, it's interesting, and I, you made a you made a really important point about the fact that it was not created from scratch right when we were facing this turbulent moment. It existed. It was well recognized. Um, and actually this year in 2021, it's the 50th anniversary of the Stuyvesant Town Peter Cooper Village Tenants Association. It was founded in 1971. Um, and it was founded in anticipation of the contract expiring between MetLife and the city. So come 1974, 25 years after the opening of the doors of Stytown, the contract is going to expire between MetLife and the city. And that means that all of a sudden there were going to be no protections for tenants. The rents could go up to any amount. The tax break that MetLife got from the city at the outset was going to disappear and MetLife was going to have the ability to uh, pass all of those costs on to residents. So they wisely got organized and fast and formed a tenants association, pushed back against that, got the community introduced into rent stabilization, extended the tax abatement for a period of 10 years, and the modern tenants association was born. And they were a, um, you know, they were an organizing force. They had some, you know, incredible uh, community activists like you know, Al Doyle and John Marsh and Susan Steinberg, who were 
they they just they they it was all volunteer, but they were so deeply committed to the cause of looking after uh, residents of this community that they would organize building by building by building and get building captains and floor leaders, and they had an apparatus to actually push back against MetLife when MetLife was doing things that they did not like or they did not think were appropriate. They were ready and they were, they were able to challenge them at every turn. And that apparatus, of course, you know, I did not build. I am not responsible for that apparatus, but I certainly, uh, you know, helped to um, to to focus that apparatus when we knew what we needed to do to be able to get this uh, you know this community on a, a more sound footing after that sale in 2006. But it was it was there before before I got there, and even just by a smidge before I was born. Um, and I think uh, we actually have some questions coming in, and one of them is um, we just I think answered, which was to tell us more about how the uh, community organized. Uh, but they are also specifically asking, which I know you address in the book. Um, I think specifically when this kind of period came, um, did you have weekly meetings and who participated and who paid the legal fees? Yeah, so <clears throat> there were not weekly meetings of this entire community. So we'll start from that proposition: thirty thousand people. It's a behemoth, 30,000 views of what to do at least, um, slightly before the real advent of social media, I might add, which I think it helped a little bit uh, because it, it just allowed for, you know, the, the temperature to go down in the community in a way that I don't think is actually possible in, in 2021. Um, but the Tenants Association had uh, their, they had a board, they had monthly meetings of their board. Um, they, you know, tapped me to help them nav navigate the turbulent waters of, uh, you know, of the real estate and political environment that we were in. Um, and I reported to them and I told them what was happening in real time. They would give me direction. Uh, and feedback, and then we would do our very best to keep the entire community uh, informed and having an organization which could communicate quickly, both by email or putting flyers under doors or, you know, get, you know, get information out fast from a trusted voice, the Tenants Association, was really important. And I, I will say that as we were in the days post Tishman Spire and trying on behalf of the tenants to preemptively buy the property for the tenants. Again, we tried it again. Um, you know, keeping people in the loop about what we were trying to do uh, while also trying to maintain the veneer of professionalism to the counterparties who might exist out there was a very delicate balance that we had to walk. Um, and I think one of the like really important points that you just brought up with the when this fight was happening, and I think that we saw a lot of this too over the summer with organizing, is that organizing often is getting out, knocking on doors, talking to the people around you, <laughs> um, and uh, it, and oftentimes social media can be good for that. But like a lot of this was done by person to person, like talking to each other, having meetings, talking it through. Um, which is a huge effort when you're thinking about how many people. Um, and I do, I do want to point out a point in the book when Hurricane Sandy happens, and you have to walk to check on every single resident in the building. <laughs> it was, it was, it was. Um, I mean, it was obviously a disaster for so many people, um, and in this community, it was no exception. There was, you know, it, this was an area where people were told to stay put. It was not officially classified as a flood zone at the time. Now it is. And so you had power out and senior citizens trapped because they couldn't get out through the elevators. And yeah, we organized, you know, about a, a week worth of daily knocking on every one of those 11,232 doors to check on neighbors and bring them what they needed and get the prescription filled and things like that. And it was, you know, it was an extraordinary and complicated effort. Um, 
so important. And we have another, this is kind of a building myth question. Um, but uh, as a longtime resident, I've always heard rumors of fabled four and five bedroom apartments that people have who have broken through to upstairs apartment and built stairs. What is the largest apartment in Stuyvesant Town? Oh boy. I don't know of any uh, four or five bedroom apartment which somebody has built up. Um, I do believe that there are a couple of apartments where it's, um, and this might be in two Peter Cooper Road where there is a an access to a piece of the roof. Um, there are, I believe, um, uh, there's certainly three bedroom apartments. Uh, on main floors of some buildings, there might even be a four or a five. I am not certain what the biggest one is, but the big ones, I am almost positive, do not involve multi floors within an existing building. They are a one bedroom combined with a two bedroom right next door. And that of course is something that the, uh, the current owner has done uh, with some units in the property. So the three bedroom apartments are a little more common than they used to be. I do always like a good New York real estate myth of how, how, the, how the buildings have been configured. Um, uh, and I want to kind of draw back into the, the other big player in this book is, of course, you. Um, and you had become, a, you were recently on, had gotten onto the New York City Council as a council member. And this, this happened like within just you just becoming a council member, this huge event of like a huge portion of the people you represent homes were about to go up for sale on the land. And you had to really pivot and dive into this. Um, and I was hoping you'd just talk a little bit more about that experience. Cause it was like, it, it was really so in the book, it's so, it comes through so clearly about how it was like, you felt like it, you had to pivot very, very quickly because, because no one was prepared for this. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was terrifying, right? It was terrifying for me and for my neighbors um, because we didn't expect it. We weren't prepared for it. And, um, you know, for me, uh, as a newly elected person, there's no uh, provision in the New York City Charter which tells you how to handle this. Um, and I remember so clearly when I got a phone call, I was in the middle of a staff meeting, and it was in July of 2006, and I got a phone call from the lobbyist for MetLife. And he said to me, hey, uh, you know, Dan, uh, I just want to let you know, MetLife is contemplating putting, you know, the asset up for sale. Or some words that I thought did not appropriately describe the, the homes to, you know, 30,000 people. But it was, they were going to test the market for selling Stytown. We're going to do something along those lines. And I remember getting off the phone thinking, come on, it just can't, it can't be. I mean, it's not even... It's, it, it's, a, it's ridiculous, right? It's, it's not possible that MetLife is going to sell Stytown. Um, and I didn't appreciate at the time that, you know, lobbyists don't call the local councilmen on a matter like this in the early stages of their client's thinking. <laughs> they call them when it's absolutely necessary to give them a heads up. And that moment was right then because the news started to dribble out that MetLife was planning to sell Stytown, exploring selling Stytown. Um, and, you know, and I, I did not know, I did not know what to do. And, you know, there were, there were some good, um, there were some very helpful people out there, as you'll see in the book, people like John Crotty, who worked for the, the Bloomberg administration at the time, was also a resident. And he, you know, was an expert on the subject. And he was somebody I'd met during the campaign. And he was really helpful in thinking through what we might do, uh, as opposed to just complaining about a sale, but actually intervening and taking a step to put ourselves in the middle of all of it. This was not my idea. Um, it was a great idea, but it was not mine. Like so many other things that I did in the city council, um, other people had some great ideas and I, uh, you know, had some sense to be able to act on them. In this case, I saw an opportunity for us to have an impact and perhaps even to come out with a great outcome for residents um, 
in a way that nobody was really expecting us to do. And so we took a big chance and we went for it. Um, but it was, you know, and bringing along the Tenants Association board, when I said to them, we should buy Stytown, they looked at me like I had looked at John Crotty. What, what are you, I mean, are you out of your mind? Like we're just getting to know each other here, right? Like, what are we going to do? How are we going to buy Stuyvesant Town? We're like, you know, a group of 10, mostly, if not completely rent stabilized residents. What, 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 how, how is this going to happen? So, yeah, we moved fast, we organized fast, and we brought the community along. And I think they were happy to have a plan and to have some leadership uh, in, a, in this really, uh, you know, unusual moment. And this battle went on for almost a decade, um, and which I don't think that it, anyone in the community could have been prepared for, for it to go on for that long. <laughs> Um, but also almost your entire career in office, <laughs> um, this was going on. Um, and I think that it's just a testament to the community itself in the book as well, because I mean, that's a lot to deal with for nearly 10 years, um, especially in the book, you go into detail about some of the more terrible practices that were taken on by um, the owners uh, throughout this time, the different owners during this time. Um, to try to get the residents to move out, to be able to raise the rents on different apartments. And I thought, um, I'd love if you could just speak a little bit more to, to what that was like. And at the end of the road of 10 years, um, and almost your entire time in office of this battle happening. Yeah, well, um, it was one of those things where, uh, you know, in public life, sometimes you do things that you have uh, set yourself out to accomplish from the outset. And other things you just are responding to because of an emergency or the dynamic that is presenting itself. Um, when we saw the, the, the efforts that were being made to get people out of their apartments, you know, claiming that people, uh, you know, weren't living there, that they were, you know, that their name was on a deed uh, to a property in Pennsylvania or that they, you know, had one point you know, paid an electric bill somewhere else or whatever. I mean, in some cases, in, a, in some number of cases, there were people who were Ill illegally living in Stytown, but not the way these owners thought was going to be. Um, and so a lot of people who were longtime residents, neighbors of ours, people who we knew, recognized, we knew they lived there. It wasn't like, you know, there was any secret. We knew th their whole family. Uh, they were getting notices from the new owner saying, you don't live in this apartment, you got to get out. And so what it did was it created this, this culture of fear and conflict immediately. Um, and it really, um, it made us determined to fight back. I mean, we had been determined to try to present a positive option for MetLife when we put our bid in to try to buy Stytown. Let's solve your problem, MetLife. We will buy it from you. But when the new owners came in, there was no positive problem solving to be had. It was a matter of survival. Um, and then when they defaulted, again, we pivoted to a positive problem solving mode. Like here, let's find a way uh, to help the lenders out of this difficult situation. Um, but they weren't always that easy as the book will show, uh, you know, to work with either. Um, and at the end of the process, and of course, I represent a district that goes, isn't just Stytown. You know, I, I wrote a book about Stytown, but my district went from 14th to 98th Street. I had a, a lot of other matters going on in, you know, in, in, in the rest of my time. Um, but the, the issues here were, were focused and they were unique among the various things that I was doing at the time. And, you know, by the time we were in a, in a place to actually strike a deal um, with a new prospective owner, we had made it, we had made it uh, so clear and so um, apparent to all that the future of this community needed to involve the tenants in the city. And of course it should, of course it should, you know, go back to the pictures that you showed at the beginning of this presentation, like how a community of this size and scale in New York City could be regarded as a private real estate transaction, even if technically speaking, it is a private real estate transaction, is in my mind, really absurd. And so we got to a place where we made it so that we were so organized 
the real estate world took notice. They understood that it was going to be better for them to make a deal with us than to just allow it to go up to the market. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, even though it was not exactly everything that we had fought for over time, it was a great relief to be able to deliver what we delivered, uh, considering that we had so little uh, to go on and so so few hooks to work with. I felt immensely relieved when I got to the end of the book. I was so happy. <laughs> I was like, oh, I feel I feel so much less stress now. Yeah. Um, sleepless nights. There were plenty of sleepless nights in that in that decade. I can assure I can you. only imagine. Um, I we have only a couple minutes left, so I just want to reiterate: if anyone has questions, now's the time to put them into the chat um, as we're wrapping up here. And we do have one more uh, here from earlier, which was: was anyone active in your fight? Also, uh, an original tenant who had fought the whites only policy. Um, you know, there were definitely original tenants who were involved. I don't know the answer to that question as to how active they were or if they were active at all in that initial battle. Um, you know, it's really interesting, you know, when you're in the middle of this entire discussion and when, you know, I mean, I grew up there, you know, I'm generally aware when I'm growing up of the dynamic in the community, even when I'm elected, I'm aware of, you know, the, the horrible racist, past of Stytown. But when you're in the middle of all of it, even though I would love to go back and ask that question, right, to an original tenant, like, can you tell me what it was like in those days when, you know, white residents were inviting Black people to live with them as a way to integrate the community? Oh, you know, they're, they're, the stories are, you know, they're incredible. And some of them I tell in the book, um, but the short answer is, I don't know the answer to that. And we were so deep in the middle of all of this. Um, I, you know, I didn't even have the sense in most cases to ask. And I didn't even appreciate until we were through it, the import and the impact nationally that this deal had on people. So it takes a little bit of reflection sometimes to, to appreciate uh, some of these things. But that is a question that I certainly would love to have asked, you know, some of the original tenants who were with us. And on that note, I'm just gonna see if we get any more questions here coming in. We are at the four minute mark to ending the program for tonight. So um, I do wanna remind everyone that the book is for sale uh, in the Tenement Museum online shop. So you can order it and we will send you a lovely copy um, of the book. Um, and if you'd like to leave a donation, you can through the link in the chat. Well, uh, I think in this time, we're going through another extraordinary time. So to end, um, I would love to ask you, what are you most looking forward to post COVID? Huh. Oh boy. You know, I kind of feel like, you know, the roaring twenties are like about to, uh, to come back. Um, the idea that um, I can go out, see people with less worry, uh, to be able to enjoy things that have been inaccessible over such a period of time. We've been so careful trying to, you know, to protect ourselves and our family, but going out to dinner with, you know, with friends without thinking about it, uh, indoor or out, going to a, a Broadway show, um, you know, going to see a, a sports event. Um, these are all things which, you know, to me are, you know, they were so, I, I feel like I took them for granted. And because I took them for granted, I now understand how important they all were to me, which means I'm going to want to do them all and more. And I'm certain that I'm not alone in this, that people are People are itching to come out of their shells. They're itching to come out of their apartments and they want to go out and enjoy themselves. And I just think that New York City is gonna be an extraordinary place to be over the coming years because where else would you want to come out of this but in the greatest city in the world with the greatest, greatest you know, creative community in the world, the greatest energy in the world. So I, um, you know, the, the short answer is everything but just doing those things that I think I took, uh, I took a little bit for granted before the pandemic uh, and getting back to them. 
it's definitely a book about fighting for your housing and now wanting to leave your housing so that we can all be outside together. Um, we did get one final question, um, which uh, is, would you run for mayor? Ha. Oh, that's a nice question. Well, not, not this year. Um, I encourage people to, you know, make sure that they're aware that the, uh, the primary election is on June 22nd, which is like a minute away in a new way of voting with ranked choice voting. Um, so uh, the short answer is, you know, I don't know whether I would return to public life at any point, um, but I really appreciate uh, the question and we'll, we'll see what, what the future holds. All right, on that note, into the future. Thank you so much. This was delightful. Daniel, thank you for being our guest of the Tenement Museum for this talk. Thanks um, for I, having me. <laughs> I hope you all go out and get the book um, and read about um, uh, Daniel's great work here in the city um, and of the residents of Stuyvesant Town um, and use it as a blueprint for your own fights for your secure and affordable housing. Um, thank you very much everyone for joining us tonight and we'll see you in the future.